Tell us your name. My name is Margaret Merrill Toscano. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, your early years, where you were born, your church experience growing up, your family, whatever you want to tell us. I was born in Mesa, Arizona. Um, I'm sixth generation Mormon. My family on um, both my mother's and father's side um, joined the church. Well, you know, there are all these lines, right? So they joined the church in Nauvoo, in, in Ohio. There were some who were English converts, but six generations back on all sides. So um, it is a, a large Mormon heritage. My father's family went down to Arizona to settle in the 1870s. So they were some of the first settlers in Arizona, some of the first colonizers as well as Mormon colonizers. So my father was born there in the Safford area. Spencer Kimball was his state president as a boy. Um, so there are a lot of family stories about, about uh, church history, family members that lived all of this personally. So that's very much a part of my heritage. Um, my mother's family lived in Utah. My mother was born in Farron, Utah, which is south of Price. During the Depression, they lost their farm and moved down to Arizona. And then my mother and father met there. So I was the third of eight children. Um, my parents, very believing, very devout. However, my family was not one of those that I would say were extremely strict. I mean, yes, it's true that very, very active in the church. Um, we didn't ever drink cola drinks when I was young <laughs> or play with face cards. I don't know where that was an old Mormon rule, right? On the other hand, my parents were not controlling. We had a, our family, there was a lot of freedom and you know we didn't have a lot of rules so uh, it was a, a home like that I think another important thing about my home growing up was that um, we had a lot of gospel discussions and in my home those were real gospel discussions it wasn't just here is what we believe and this is what you're supposed to believe but there were open-ended questions and that was seen as perfectly okay you know, even though my parents considered themselves, they're very orthodox, they were certainly not intellectuals. They were, neither one of them had a college degree, but very intelligent people, very much like to talk about the gospel. What was your father's profession? Uh, my father, when I was a young girl, um, had a farm and a ranch with my uncle. And um, then when I was about, let me think, I was in fourth grade, I was about nine, we lost the whole thing. And that was very devastating to the family. That had a huge effect on all of us. We had a, there was a period of about five years where my father didn't have a permanent job. Um, he went from one part-time job to another. Finally, one of the men in our stake who had recently become the tax commissioner for Arizona got my job, my father a job. And um, that basically saved the family. Mm. But it also meant that during the, those years of my junior high years, um, if I had any new clothes, I had to babysit to buy them. And so it definitely affected us in a lot of ways. Um, eventually, my father, you know, there was more economic stability, but that was certainly hard. When I was, went to BYU, I had to totally support myself. Uh, so I always worked. I went to BYU as a freshman. Well, what was your church experience personally growing up in terms of primary young women's, your reflections on what the church meant to you at that age, your spiritual feelings or lack thereof? Um, growing up, uh, first of all, I think the church was different. I mean, this is in the 1950s, the 1960s. Um, it was sort of a hometown religion in many ways. I mean, Mesa was settled by Mormons, so there were a lot of Mormons in the city. Eventually, Arizona, Mesa and the Arizona area became more, there was more of an influx of non-members. So I think very much like in being in Utah, um, 
growing up in Arizona, in Mesa, as an LDS person, as a Mormon, um, the church was your whole life. And, you know, you went to primary one day, you, later you went to MIA on Tuesday night or whatever. Sunday was, um, we went to church, Sunday school in the morning at 10 o'clock, right? You were there for two hours, you went home, you had dinner, you visited family. It was all a very family day. And then in the evening you went back for a sacrament meeting. And I remember, for example, in our home ward there in Arizona, having Joseph Fielding Smith visit. Mm. I remember David McKay visiting. I remember, you know, there were general authorities that visited all the time. We had the same bishop for 17 or was it 20 years. Um, I, was, I was the type who always really enjoyed... Um, I liked Bible stories. I liked, I liked knowing about the about the gospel. We had Bible story books in our home, and I remember being the type of kid that if we'd have little quizzes in in Sunday school about information we'd studied, I always wanted to have the right answer. <laughs> so I, I was interested in that. I mean, it was very positive, um, very positive. There, I came from such a believing family that I saw myself as believing. I think by the time I got to high school, though, that I began to question certain things. I was very much, I was a good student. I loved reading. I was always an avid reader from the time I was a little tiny girl. My first loves were literature and art. And, but I was also really interested in film, so I remember in high school in the 1960s that I really loved art films, and I would go to see movies that would have shocked my, my uh, friends at church. So I, I think by the time I was in high school, I was, I was very much in the church. It meant a lot to me. Um, I could feel the faith of my parents. Um, I began to question when I was in high school, um, but I think I still felt myself as a believer very much. What were some of your favorite movies, some of those movies you talked about? Um, 1967, The Graduate. <laughs> I think that really influenced me. What is another one? Midnight Cowboy, um, The Pawnbroker with Rod Steiger. Uh, other movies that I loved in that late 1960s period were the Zeffirelli Shakespeare films, the Romeo and Juliet of the 1960s, and the, um, the Taming of the Shrew with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, mm -hmm. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. Um, I was really interested in movies and in literature. I remember when I was 18 reading Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. And I think that was a very important book for me, no, no, for exploring my sexuality, understanding it, helping me understand it. How unique was this for a small town girl from Arizona to be seeing these movies and reading these types of books? Were you sort of um, very unique, perceived as being really unique? Yes. <laughs> and did you feel bad about that? Did you feel supported? Did you feel well, like first of all, it's not something I would have talked to my parents about. You know, even though my parents were very open and certainly didn't try to control us, I mean, they would never have tried to control what we watched um, or what we read. Um, they were more of the type who you teach them, they believe that you teach them correct principles and they would trust us to do what is right. Um, so my parents, you know, never tried to control that. In terms of my church friends, Maybe I even liked being a little bit rebellious in the sense, but it wasn't just simply to be rebellious. I was not the rebel without a cause. Right. <laughs> um, it was more that I wanted to know. I had a curiosity. But I think I was unique both in, in, in terms of my church friends, definitely so. They would not have gone to these movies with me. And even in my high school group, there was a, a small group of us that were part of the drama club. I was in the, the, the National Thespian Society, and I was in, in drama. And there was a small group of us that would go to art movies. 
and but that was a very small minority in my high school. So I mean, Mesa was how much of a small town was Mesa? Um, certainly not. It's next to Phoenix, right? And it, it was smaller. It's really grown big now. But um, we had what two big high schools? There were probably three thousand in my high school, so it wasn't like a small high school or anything. So even within that high school, it was a small group. So was there ever a point where you wanted some type of spiritual confirmation? You wanted a certainty of the validity of the church and its truthfulness. Did you ever seek for that intentionally as a teenager? And did you ever get the type of response you were hoping for? I, I took seminary all four years, and I started reading the Book of Mormon. I don't think I finished the Book of Mormon at that point. At that point in my life, I was not as interested in um, having that sort of a confirmation. I think I just, there was a part of me that just believed. I, I think that my home was such a, it was not a dogmatic home, but my mother, for example, was the kind of woman who had spiritual experiences and would tell the family about them and her parents had and so there was this climate of faith and I think there was a way in which it I just imbibed it it was not until I became I was a freshman at BYU that I had that sort of desire to know as a I would say that from the time I was from 18 through about 21 at BYU was the period where I was really wanting to have my own confirmation of that and it, it really was quite a struggle. I didn't feel it. I remember wanting that confirmation at BYU and praying and not having anything spectacular at all, but finally having this realization that it, it came from the point, this realization that I had was that I, that if I tried to doubt it, that there would be a part of me very deep down that just knew. So when I, what I finally came to realize was that I perhaps was not going to get this spectacular experience that you read about in scriptures. But for me, the important thing was that if I doubted and forced myself to doubt, I knew that really deep down I did believe in in the existence of God, that there was truth in Mormonism. So it, it came more from uh, that negative proposition of, it was very important for me to doubt. Because if I hadn't have doubted, then I would have felt intellectually dishonest. I needed to doubt. But the more I doubted, and the more I told myself I didn't believe, and the more I tried not to believe, the more I found that there was a spiritual core in me that I didn't know where it came from, that basically I, 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 I felt something more than just simply the physical reality of things. So I would explain that. Now, so that's the experience I had between like 18 and 21 or 22. Later, when I was in my 21, 22, I had an experience that I would call a born-again experience in terms of reading the Book of Mormon. But that came not so much from questioning or asking, you know, wanting my own testimony. I wasn't seeking for a testimony. I was in deep pain because of depression and was calling out for spiritual help. Depressed at BYU? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, have you thought about, I mean, what, were the, what was the environment, what were the circumstances? I mean, first of all, I mean, depression is a very complex um, phenomenon, right? And definitely there's depression in my family. So, I, and they say that it runs in families. My mother had a lot of depression. Um, where did it come from? It's hard to explain. I think for me, it was part of a whole identity crisis of trying to figure out who I was, what I wanted, um, 
certainly the the typical BYU um, goal of you go there, you meet some great return missionary, you get married. That didn't happen for me at BYU exactly like that at all. Um, and was that part of it? I'm sure it was because there is enormous pressure. Um, so to me, it's probably a combination of a um, probably a family disposition toward uh, depression, the fact that I am, I tend to be an interior person. If you go to the Myers-Briggs test, I'm, I'm very much an interior person. I'm, I was always a deep thinker who had to have meaning to things. Um, I want to understand things. That was true of me when I was a teenager, as I said. Um, for all of those reasons, I, I was seeking to know who I was, what I wanted, what my place was in life. I think this was the beginning of the gender issue for me, that at BYU, to be a smart girl, um, on the one hand, to be a smart girl is a, is a difficult thing because they, they don't encourage that, or at least they didn't back in the early 1970s when I was there, the late 60s, the early 1970s. So I think all of those factors came together. And then um, I guess the other factor is that um, I met a man there uh, who was my first husband, and he was the one who introduced me to Mormon documents. Um, but also he, um, he, what can I say? <laughs> I shouldn't have gotten into this, right? I may be, end up revealing more here than I want to. Uh, well, let's just say it this way, that, you know, having this boyfriend, and he was not the typical return missionary BYU boyfriend, um, you know, the, there was a way in which my sexuality suddenly, you know, I was awakened to things. Um, Gosh, I'm going to, I know, <laughs> cut, 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 cut. <laughs> I know. Paul's laughing up there. I, I don't know <laughs> if we can edit any of this. <laughs> no, that's fine. So, so a new but world. But actually, a, a new world opened to me. Yeah. But this is all very important because I had, uh, yeah, I mean, back in, they probably still do this, that you feel guilty if you pet, right? right? You feel guilty if you French kiss. You feel guilty if you do anything. You know, any kind of sexuality outside of marriage is, you feel guilty for. Right. And, you know, but this was very important for my whole spiritual journey because, in fact, the irony is that as I explored what my sexuality was and explored my sexual feelings, and suddenly saw myself as a sinner because I had crossed some line you know, that you weren't supposed to cross because the church had these absolute standards of sexuality. Um, this sort of whole ironic thing happened that as the perfect Mormon girl who had lived all of the rules and had done everything I wanted, I was depressed and unhappy. And I couldn't figure out why, if I had lived all the rules and done all the things and supposedly had a testimony, I knew that I believed in God, I had tried to doubt it, but I knew I felt that there was a spiritual realm and I believed in it. Why was I unhappy? Why wasn't the formula working for me? When I suddenly became a sinner because I had crossed the sexual line, and as I began then to search in the scriptures and search, I had the spiritual experience where I felt God's grace and God's forgiveness, where these rules that the church had told me were this, these very strict rules and that if you defy them and if you go against them, that you're a bad person. And then suddenly I felt God's grace and God's forgiveness, this I had an experience where I was so overwhelmed with the love of God, where I felt the love of Christ in a way that made me know that I was okay as a person, which the church had never made me feel. The church makes you feel condemned and judged, and you know that if you do not line up in a certain way that you're not okay, 
what I felt in this experience was that the love of God was bigger than all of that and that and that God prized me I mean and it was not just God I mean I felt the presence of Jesus Christ and I felt his love and I felt this transformation in a way that I could deal with my depression and my sense of my inadequacy I tend you know the church wants you to be perfect and I'm already a perfectionist by my personality and it was killing me because you could never be good enough. And what I felt in this spiritual experience was that, that God's love, the love of Christ, was enough. That that sort of perfection that the church was asking for was death. That that was not what I should be seeking for. What I should be seeking for was to develop my mind, to have more compassion, all of these interiorities that were important to me was what God cared about. That The little rules didn't matter. They, those could be wiped away in a minute, but it was the larger, it was the larger issues of spirituality that really mattered. How you treated other people, how you thought, those kinds of things. So, I mean, this was a transforming experience. And what, was there anything specific you were doing that brought it on? Actually, it was reading the Book of Mormon. There were two things. I was, I was in a crisis. This was, when I had this experience, it was, I had just graduated from BYU. I had, I graduated in English. This was 1972. I graduated in English. I... Um, originally I was going to do teaching in high school. I had always wanted to teach. From the time I was a little girl, I wanted to teach. And I used to play teacher, and I had this big collection of pictures and everything, and I wanted to be a teacher. Well, I did student teaching, and I found I was not good at it. <laughs> I was just not confident enough. I was too intellectual for the high school group. I was more interested in ideas. I was more interested in... Uh, all these questions and really if you're going to do high school you need to have a strong disciplinarian side to you and I was not like that so I had a huge crisis over that that I graduated now suddenly I knew I couldn't teach in high school I had this boyfriend that was not church approved who was sort of leading me into areas that the church disapproved of I didn't have money. I went to Salt Lake. I got a job at a car dealership. I was in a horrible crisis. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. It was not fitting into the pattern. I decided I was going to read the Book of Mormon again. And, you know, so here I am, this avid reader, and I had read the Book of Mormon in my Book of Mormon class, but, you know, it, you know, it was interesting, but I'd never felt anything in it. Um, so that summer, as I'm reading the Book of Mormon, I'm in this identity crisis, I'm feeling depressed, and as I'm reading the passages in the Book of Alma about the conversion of Alma, and if I had a Book of Mormon, I could read the passage, but there's a passage in there that talks about the spiritual rebirth where he felt the love of God come and upon him, and I had the same experience. I mean, I'm going to cry talking about it. It's a long time ago. But, you know, for somebody who is feeling so much um, self-loathing, so lost, uh, I was feeling all of those things to feel as I read this. I, I, all I can say is that there was this light that descended on me and I felt filled with the love of God and that nothing mattered except for that he loved me and I was worthwhile, and that that was enough. So read the Book of Mormon. <laughs> isn't it, isn't is that the takeaway? Isn't, it, the isn't, this, isn't this hilarious? <laughs> that the, you know, the, the big apostate, you know, the big dissenter and apostate has this amazing testimony in the Book of Mormon. And so, in fact, it's so ironic because... I mean, I know about all the DNA problems. I know that this sounds like a, a 19th century document. But the truth of it is, is that I, on more than one occasion, I was absolutely transformed by the spiritual power of the doctrine of the Book of Mormon. So I don't know whether it's an ancient document. I mean, the evidence seems to be against it. But for me, it's a sacred text. 
which is something larger. And because for me, the you know, God worked through the Book of Mormon and touched my heart in a way that that changed me. And I think the most important book of the most important message of the Book of Mormon is this personal spiritual message, because really I think that's what everybody needs.